picture this. You're a desert trader walking from China along the Silk Road back to Europe. You hear of a Khanate located in a desert oasis on the borders of modern day Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. It's a weird place, a strange place. It's a desert. But seemingly out of the desert rises up this oasis and this great city. You stumble upon Hiva, this fortified clay city that seemingly pops up out of nowhere. You get lost in its majestic tile artwork, its mausoleums, its mosques. You stay for a while. You learn about the people. You learn about the culture. And it truly encapsulates you. I'm in Akiva today, and this city, even though it's 1,500 years old, absolutely stunned me. I have maybe never been someplace so enchanting and so beautiful my whole life, and I cannot wait to share it with you. Come along. We start our journey today inside a 150-year-old madrasi in the center of the city. You can see the style here is absolutely stunning. It has these Islamic features, but this is an amazing part about Turkmenistan is this blue turquoise tile that they put on everything. A madrasi in the olden times was a place of Islamic learning. People would come from all over this empire and other empires to study with the imams and hojas to learn the words of the Quran and to become better carriers of the Islamic faith. This place is amazing. It was a place of learning where you could walk amongst the gardens. It, was, it had rooms. It's very much like a, a common monastery that you'd find in Europe. But the attention to detail and the amount of beauty that they've got going on here is simply astounding. This is what I would call the main drag of Hiva. So here you have this central street with a very epic minaret. This is the most famous minaret in the city probably. It's this massive turquoise minaret that was built in the 1850s by one of the last Hans who ruled over this land. And here is what they're calling the inner castle. So it's a fortress with really high clay walls. And they have these beautiful interlaying things that they've got going on here. So Hiva is split into two main parts. We have this part, which is called the outer city or the outer castle. This is pretty cool. This is a place where kids were like fighting each other last night. And then there's this inner castle that we'll go explore now. I haven't been in here yet. It seems like I'll have Uzbek background music for this whole video because they're uh, doing a festival tonight, which I will certainly capture on this video. So stick around for that. But we're in the inner fortress now. This is called the Junka Ark, and this was a palace. And so you can see here the excellent examples of tile work that they've done all over this city. And the great part is that all of the old tiles were done by hand. And so each tile, while of course they're in the same style, are all individually unique, which is unreal. And the amount of tile that they actually did is also unreal. So you can see it just goes and goes and goes. This city is truly an artisan city and all of the features of everything is so ornate. And here you can see this is the woodwork on one of these pillars. They up here, they've done uh, painted woodwork up top here. And down here, they've done the same work, but on granite. Unbelievable. So this would have been the room where the Khan would have sat, or the ruler of the city. You can see these beautiful walls and a pretty epic chair, fit for a pretty epic guy. got a nice little bird's eye view for you guys here. So this is Hiva. You can see the wall here. Everything outside of that is the outer city. And it's absolutely beautiful. The story of Hiva goes like this. About in 900 AD, there were some Persian settlers who settled Hiva. But in the 10th century, as the Turkic people started to expand, they took over this place and set up 
a Khanate. A Khanate is kind of an offshoot of what happened during the Mongolian Empire, and a Khan ruled over the land kind of as a tributary person. The Khan typically wouldn't influence so much as long as you paid taxes and didn't mess with his military ideas or with what was happening within his society. Shiva became the center of this Grand Khanate and expanded and lost borders for quite a long period of time. Throughout the years, this has always been a place of trade, uh, of goods, of knowledge, and of resources. So this walled city came to include lots of residents, and then outside the city, people also lived in encampments and small houses. The weird part about this city is you're looking at it, it looks extremely Islamic, extremely Central Asian, extremely not what you're picturing would be in the Soviet Union. So um, towards the end of the Khanate, the late 1870s, this was incorporated into the Russian Empire. This actually was its own SSR, so Soviet Socialist Republic, for five years from 1920 to 1925 before being incorporated into the greater Uzbek SSR. This was in the Soviet Union. People from the Soviet Union could travel here. So this is the diversity of the Soviet Union that I would like to describe. When you think of the Soviet Union, obviously this is not what you're thinking of. Some thousand year old desert thing that comes basically out of Aladdin, but it was here and it's beautiful. And now it remains one of the touristy parts of this country, but it's really out of the way. So not a lot of people actually make the journey out here. From this perch on these old clay walls, you can also see New Kiva. And this way, just about 10 kilometers, is Turkmenistan over there. But you can see a lot of the new hotels have built in the similar style that you find in the old city. And then you find generally, you know, like just normal housing, what you'd find during the Soviet Union. One funny thing for me is that being from New Mexico, it seems like they've used clay and also straw to build these huge fortifications here, which is exactly what we do in New Mexico. And this thing, if you've ever been to a Native American place, looks like a Hopi dwelling, which we have in New Mexico also. It's the exact same idea, and a lot of the, uh, a lot of the weather elements and the resources that they have here are also the same. That's so strange. Love it. into a small cafe to escape the uh, the heat. It's like 102 degrees outside and it's brutal. So this hat, no sun protection. So we're gonna, I, I ordered some stuff off the menu. I don't even know what I got. We're gonna see what we get. Both are traditional Kiva dishes. Very excited. But here's what the restaurant looks like. So the first food of the mystery food that I've ordered is called a guma. Here it is. It seems to be a flatbread stuffed with meat. Very similar to a Turkish gözleme, for those of you that know what that is. It looks nice, it smells nice. Let's give it a try. So it's a mincemeat patty filled with uh, probably beef or lamb and onions, spices, inside this really nice thin gözleme, thin pancake. Yeah, it's a little bit crispy from the from the griddle that they fry it on, and it's super delicious. Okay, so we've got our next course here. We've got a sveji salad, mixed fresh salad, lots of dill. They like the dill. It's cool. And then secondarily, we've got a, a beautiful plate of some type of meat with what looks like a yogurt sauce, and then various beautiful chopped vegetables. <laughs> And then the bread here in Hiva is super cool. It's a, it's a flat bread, but they, they press an indentation into it. So like you can rip it off with the indentation and it's actually very beautiful from both sides. And they always serve it like this. It's beautiful. The word for bread in Uzbek is naan, which is like Indian naan. I tried to say the word in Turkish and I tried to say the word in Russian yesterday and I could not get bread. So if you ever go to Uzbekistan, naan, that's what you're looking for. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the move is. I'm not even sure what kind of meat it is. But it smells kind of sweet. Mm. I would say it's beef, but I'm really not sure. 
It's incredibly savory. I think it will pair really nicely with this chopped veg. And everything here is either grilled or roasted in some way. They do something called the mandal. It's this open charcoal situation that they grill on all over Central Asia and in Turkey. So, uh, or it's cooked on some sort of flat top with a pan. And uh, Uzbek food so far has been uh, quite meat heavy, quite bread heavy, and the vegetables that they have at their disposal are very, very limited because uh, they live in oases, so the, what they can grow is not normally super widespread. And in the winter, they can't grow a lot of things because it actually, even though we're in the desert, it gets really cold here. Apparently it gets to like negative 20 degrees up in Tadakal, Pakistan, where I was before. And here it can get, you know, like sub-zero. So they have to pickle things. So you find a lot of some vinegar and pickles here as well. So I'm gonna go for this and we're gonna explore more of Hiva. Let's do it. Mm. Let's go. Whew, delicious and back into the sun. Let's explore more of Hiva. But first impressions, this whole city is just absolutely splendid. And the cool thing that I'll show you right here is what we saw in Kyrgyzstan. This is actually the top of a yurt. And so here in Uzbekistan as well, because there are lots of nomadic Uzbeks, they would take these along with various cloths and sheets and rugs, and they would make yurts also in the desert here. And they're apparently good for the winter. Keep you warm. These are the local vans that they use here. They call them marshutkas, that's in Russian. And uh, it's made by the Damas company. And they're so small. The wheels are the smallest wheels I've ever seen. It's very goofy looking. You never know what you're gonna find here and behind these wooden doors, there are many more madrasis or places, places where clerics lived to learn the Quran next to a mosque. And they're all so beautiful and they're so intensely ornate and ancient. This one's from the 1800s. What's so impressive is the care that everyone took within the city to make sure that every detail was perfect. Up here you can see they've added turquoise. They've got nice highlights and all of the molding all of the walls which is clearly made out of mud must be taken care of yearly someone had an aesthetic idea of what this city was going to look like and the entire city became an outdoor museum and it's been a place of pilgrimage ever since Assalamu alaikum. Okay. Wow. And this is this is all hand carved. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Look at this. Uh huh. This is all hand carved. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Look at this. Walnut. Uh huh. Elm. Walnut and elm. Wow. How much is a door? How much do you sell for? $6,000. $6,000? Wow. That's beautiful. Secret box, yeah? The secret box, yeah. What? Wow. Wow. Two. Three. Four. Five. What? Six. Seven, eight, nine tablet. Tablet again. Okay, that was wild. Apparently, it takes, for example, this hand-carved wooden door, which is obviously very old, but you can see see the details. It takes three people six months to do a hand-carved wooden door, and that little box that he was playing with takes one person nine days to build. Artisans, man. Think about uh, what people did before the internet, probably. I'm just absolutely blown away. The attention to detail, the mosaics, the, the fact that everything matches. It's like 
kind of the idea of what they did in Paris or of these cities where they really had an idea and they wouldn't let anyone build anything outside the, the scope of what was being built. And then you just have these huge madrasis, places of Islamic learning, and these very particular Uzbek-style minarets. Workout guy. Let's see. I'm not sure if this is a normal day here. They have some sort of youth festival. The, some guys were telling me about it, but this city is so alive with culture and with people wearing traditional clothing. And it's like, it's, it's vibrant, it's awesome. This is the coolest cultural experience I've had in a while. The whole city is just lit up with people playing traditional songs and singing and it's bouncing off the walls. It's so beautiful. I mean, they even have a, they even have a camel amongst, amongst everything. It's a very touristy thing. It seems like a very lonely camel, but he's there. So I'm gonna get out of the sun before I torch myself and I will see you guys at the festival. So it's festival time. I'm walking to the stage. There's like thousands of people out here. This is the most people I've seen in over a year in one place. I actually can't believe my eyes. Look at this. So this is absolute chaos. I've been trying to get up front here and it's just not possible. Oh, they started playing music. It's been like an hour. They aren't playing music. They're over capacity. If you can believe that. So they're trying to get people to leave before they start playing music. And now this lady behind me, there she is. She's trying to use me as a tourist kind of trap so they can like get us in there. Apparently this is the youth festival. Everyone here is very nice. I think I'm the only tourist here. And uh, they're very aggressive. The, the police, lots of police, very, very aggressive, but people here also very aggressive. It's like a Middle Eastern thing. So, uh, not sure where it's gonna go, but lots of people, and they're gonna play some music. There we go. Crazy festival time. Very excited. <laughs>